Sometime towards the middle of March 2020, a violent communist wanted for crimes against humanity named Tedos Adhanom Ghebreyesus said that everyone should commit socio-economic seppuku or otherwise they'll cough to death due to the Wuhan virus. He was, and still is, the director general of what the deputy prime minister of Japan accurately called the China Health Organization, the UN body that is also responsible for the severe destruction of the pork industry in 2009, also for absolutely no scientific reason whatsoever. Yet almost all did listen to this clown whose nomination was vigorously opposed in his home country but heavily bankrolled by the Chinese Communist Party. Almost all listened, but a few didn't. Japan was one of them, South Korea, Taiwan, Belarus, Brazil, large portions of the United States, Turkmenistan and Sweden were also the countries that were far from keen on shutting down their societies over a virus that, while dangerous for the elderly, it is neither Ebola nor some alien sci-fi contagion. From Europe, two of the least friendly countries when it comes to freedom got this one right. Sweden and Belarus. Feminist democratorship and the Soviet banana republic. How did that happen? Out of the countries that defied globalist wisdom, Sweden was clearly the easiest one to research for us. Direct flight available, previous knowledge of the local language, no visa requirements and friends of the network already living there. So we spent three weeks in the Nordic Kingdom, traveling about 4,000 kilometers by train and bus, observing daily pandemic life and constantly comparing it with the rest of Europe, talking both on and especially off the record with medical professionals, lawyers and business people and, yes, goddammit, having a bit of fun too. In the end, we will probably piss off everyone with the results of the research. Or maybe not. Let's explore. Hello everyone and welcome to the first episode of the miniseries Pandemic Sweden, where we will dissect as many aspects as possible of the Swedish response to the Wuhan flu in order to, hopefully, draw some lessons from it. And we will start with what we know best, the politics. While many still do claim to this day, despite overwhelming evidence, that politics doesn't matter or even more naively, that politics shouldn't matter, the reality is that the narrative and subsequently the response to the Wuhan flu is almost entirely political at this point. While back in March we at Freedom Alternative Network were part of a tiny minority that insisted this is the case and will be the case, at this moment in time one would have to be really blind not to notice that it's all politics. If it hadn't been political, then almost everyone would have been on the Swedish pandemic model by now, considering their current numbers, but more on the numbers in the third episode. By politics, we mean not just the decision to buck the Chinese wisdom, but also all of the subsequent decisions. But first things first. Unlike most of Europe, in Sweden, the Ministry of Health is not a huge institution. The cabinet minister can't be transformed into a health fuer like it happened in Germany or France. In Sweden, at least in the last 200 years, such technocratic issues are managed by an independent agency. Now, the degree of that independence can vary, so is the name and the scope of the agency, but what's most important is that politicians can't just override those agencies willy-nilly. In our case, that agency is called Folkhälsomyndig Hetten, or FHM, or the Public Health Agency of Sweden. While on paper part of the Ministry of Health and Social Affairs, the FHM's activity has remained surprisingly non-political over the decades. In theory, such system exists in Norway and Denmark too, but the tradition of trusting the agency is far less observed. 
We know this because their equivalents of the FOM had the same recommendations as the Swedish one, but their panicked governments decided that they know better or that the wisdom of the Chinese Communist Party is superior to the homegrown one. So while the political instinct was to go with the herd, much to our surprise, the political power, in this case Stefan Löfven and the Social Democrats, actually followed the mechanism, which is to have the FHOM at the forefront of the issue, while the political power only steps in if it's necessary and only if the FHOM says so. Oh, and only if the parliament agrees too. So this created right from the get-go a set of expectations that was, and continues to be, radically different than most of the rest of Europe. In most of the rest of Europe, governments just appointed an expert, established an emergency committee, and rushed to get emergency powers. And then started playing dictatorship for a while, with Spain being by far the worst example, arguably criminal, if we are to look at what lawyers specialized in international criminal court cases have to say. In Sweden, however, the political power was asked to take a seat and don't rush to do anything stupid. First, gatherings larger than 500 people are banned and universities are recommended to switch to a remote model. Recommended, not ordered. Not all of them did, and definitely not all at once. Shortly thereafter, Mr. Löfven makes one of the most surprising speeches, second in surprising levels only to Alexander Lukashenko, albeit for different reasons. Surprising because one simply does not expect a socialist leader of an otherwise collectivist society to appeal to the individual. Listen to this segment. Men du ska också veta att vi som samhälle möter denna kris med hela vår samlade styrka. Nu har vi alla ett stort eget ansvar. Var och en av oss har ett ansvar att förhindra smittspridning, att skydda äldre och andra riskgrupper. Ingen av oss får chansa. Ingen av oss får gå till jobbet med symptom. Ung, gammal, rik eller fattig spelar ingen roll. Alla behöver göra sin del. Det gäller även dig som är 70 plus eller tillhör en annan riskgrupp. Jag förstår att det är frustrerande att behöva begränsa ditt liv, dina sociala kontakter, men det är just nu nödvändigt. För din egen hälsas skull såklart, men också för att skydda andra människor och ge sjukvården en möjlighet att klara av situationen. Och vi som är vuxna behöver nu vara just vuxna. Inte sprida panik eller rykten. Ingen människa står ensam inför denna kris. Men varje person har ett tungt ansvar. Var enda en. Don't spread panic, be an adult, be an individual. That's something one would expect Trump to say, or in general a more classical liberal, I don't know, but not a socialist. <sighs> but such is life with the Wuhan flu. Brings the best and the worst from people one expects the least. Keeping your mental sanity when most people go bananas is not an easy task. Speaking of mental sanity, preserving whatever is left of the mental sanity of the Swedish people was one of the many arguments the FHOM used in public against the idea of imposing a lockdown. And boy, they were right on the money. And anyone can easily verify that by checking the psychopathologies going brrr in countries that adopted a sanitary dictatorship model. So that's reason number one on how this happened. The FHOM as the driver, that is to say, the science, rather than political narcissism. And luckily, the face of the whole thing happened to be someone also quite competent, the now famous or infamous Nils Anders Stegnell. Now, if I wanted an interview with him, I should have stayed in Sweden for at least seven weeks and be available on a short notice. That's how long and chaotic the backlog of interviews with him was when I queried for this possibility. But that's okay. There isn't much that he'd say to me that hasn't already been said. What should be emphasized is that Mr. Tegnell is a man who worked with serious diseases in the front line before. He worked in Laos with malaria and measles between 1990 and 1993, as well as during the 1995 Ebola outbreak in what is today the Democratic Republic of Congo. In other words, he's a man who is a lot harder to scare with crazy graphs and dumb models like Mr. Ferguson did with Boris Johnson. <laughs> 
Reason number two, the Swedish constitution and the legal framework. You see, the constitution turns out to be a serious impediment in other countries too, such as my own, with the current administration being routinely flattened by the constitutional court. But while here we have to file cases to the court in order to enforce it, in Sweden it was and is observed before one gets to do anything. You can't just simply declare a state of emergency and do whatever you want for 60 days and only afterwards you get scrutinized by checks and balances, like it happened in France, Austria and Romania. Well, in Sweden, the constitution outright forbids policies that were commonplace in France, Italy, Spain, Hungary, Romania, Serbia or even Switzerland. And freedom of movement is a constitutionally protected right in Sweden. Allemansretten, which is oftentimes translated into English as the right to roam in nature, is so important in the Swedish framework that even property laws are written around this. In this footage, we're walking on a private road. In most countries of the world, it would have been illegal for us to be here, let alone filming, but not in Sweden. In other words, you simply cannot issue a stay-at-home order and then send the police to enforce it. The very idea is so contrary to the Swedish framework that not even most of the local panicards were willing to go that far in their advocacy for sanitary fascism. The concept, once again, exists in other Nordic countries as well, but only Sweden has it explicitly codified in, con in the constitution. So while in Germany the police organizes a manhunt to catch someone who likes the woods, or in Romania people got fined during the lockdown for hiking alone in the woods, in Sweden that is regarded as so sacrosanct that essentially nobody is allowed to restrict it, least of all because of an epidemic. The legal framework through which an epidemic can be managed is regulated by a lesser known law called Smithhuit's Log, or the Communicable Diseases Act of 2004, which also contains strong limitations. For instance, no matter how serious the disease is, you can't quarantine a whole city, let alone a whole region, and definitely not the whole country. You can only quarantine individuals, and only if the parliament agrees, and the individual must have the right to appeal the decision in court. In fact, even the few things you can do as a government still have to be pre-approved by the parliament at first, and then once again after you implement them. So, for instance, the government can say they want to ban gatherings larger than 10 people, but if the parliament disagrees, then tough luck. Now compare that with most of Europe, where governments turned full fascist overnight and some low-life bureaucrat suddenly claimed the right to tell you to only leave your home when he approves it via a written paper, like it happened in France and Romania. Of course, those were also illegal and unconstitutional, but we had to wait for the state of emergency to end in order to petition the court and flatten the obviously illegal abuses of power. So, on April the 16th, the Parliament did amend the Communicable Diseases Act with temporary provisions, which expired on July the 1st while we were still there, authorizing the government a few extra policies that it can adopt without prior approval, but the government still had to seek approval within a few days from the Parliament. This included the prerogative to restrict trains, buses, close markets, shopping malls and redistribute medical supplies without waiting for the region's bureaucracy to settle it. That's it. Nothing more. Still no forced admissions into the hospital, like it happens in Romania, much to everyone's shock, though admittedly taking advantage of a populace who doesn't vigorously assert its right. Nothing about closing churches, like it happened in most of Europe. I mean, we went to church during the pandemic, not to pray, but to check if it's open. And it was. Now, if you want to sell the narrative that the Swedes are so obedient that they all followed the recommendation not to go to church, you can use this footage and say so. But it would be dishonest since this footage was taken around noon on a Saturday. In reality, Swedes don't really go to church that much. In 2017, I was unable to find anyone in any church other than the priest if I went at the right time. So empty churches are common in Sweden, pandemic or no pandemic. And can you blame them? Svenska Shirka is hardly a church anymore. Anyway, that's a topic for another day. Back to the legislation. The only thing that changed after April the 17th was that the public gatherings were limited to 50 instead of 500, and a nationwide ban on visiting elderly care facilities was imposed. 
that last one turned out to be very important. Once nobody got into the elderly care facilities, the number of deaths went down, all the way down to zero on July the 24th, the 25th, and the 26th. And you can see the general mortality graph too. Mortality is once again lower than the last five years, just as it was in February and early March. The ban on gatherings wasn't really enforced, though. This is Sergel's tour in Stockholm in June the 3rd, for instance. And most restaurants had more than 50 customers at once routinely and on the inside. And none of that insanity with masks, either. In fact, masks are unbelievably haram in Sweden, and in Denmark for that matter. The public health agencies explicitly recommend against them being used by healthy people, and those who are ill are advised to stay at home rather than roam around with a muzzle on. And that's common sense and very sound advice. Wearing a muzzle when you have a respiratory disease, be it China virus or any other respiratory pathogen, is outright harmful. Recently, the Netherlands joined that club too. Also, it is seriously debatable that you can impose masks in Sweden, legally speaking. It really comes down handy in times like these to have limits on the government and at the same time limits on activists. I mean, without activists, Sweden could become once again a livable place. <laughs> but that's also a story for another day. Reason number three, economics. Now, if you take a trip down the memory lane back in November 2019, we published a one-hour-long video with plenty of evidence making the case that Sweden is essentially bankrupt. Please watch that video if you haven't done so already, because it is really important to keep it in mind when talking about economics in the context of the Chinese cough. You see, in addition to the medical reason provided by Mr. Tegnell, namely that lockdown type of policies simply aren't sustainable as they harm the health of the populace a lot more than the virus itself, there was also a strong economic reason not to go down that route, even if the constitution would have allowed it. Same goes for Belarus. There wasn't a surge in rational thought and love for individual liberty in the Lukashenko administration. It's just that the country couldn't afford it. And Sweden couldn't afford it either. It's clear that Sweden did suffer economically because of this situation anyway, given that most of its export partners did go into a, some form of lockdown, but when all is said and done, Sweden still suffered less. And that's important because, unlike, let's say, Germany, Sweden really doesn't have much wiggle room to afford to pay people to stay at home and do nothing for two months, as many countries did. On the other hand, if this strategy turns out to be sustainable, and so far there is absolutely no reason to doubt that it will, over the longer run Sweden can avoid going into big troubles financially. They'll still suffer, and many Swedes already perceive themselves as poorer, and likely not without reason, but they still stand a chance to avoid an even worse fate. How much worse? Well, that's hard to tell now, but watch the performances of Denmark and Norway to get an idea. It's not going to be an easy ride, especially for Denmark. Because the economy is not just about money, as collectivists and panic cards like to claim. Panic cards routinely dismissed economic arguments with petty sophistry like, oh, you care more about your money than the life of grandma. But the reality is that without a functional economy, nobody is there to treat and save grandma to begin with. Oh, and there is no money to pay grandma's pension either, or money to even keep the hospital open for that matter. When all will be said and done, Sweden will very likely report a much smaller cost in human life over this ordeal than almost everyone else in Europe. Why? Because economics is also human lives. The 2009 recession is responsible for an extra 250,000 cancer deaths worldwide as a result of people postponing cancer screenings. 
In Britain in present day, the government itself calculated that roughly 200,000 people will die in Britain alone just as a direct result of the lockdown without ever contracting the China virus. Sure, they didn't cough, but they also didn't treat more serious infections, had life-saving surgeries postponed, or didn't even discover illnesses to begin with as a result of hospitals prioritizing the Wuhan coronavirus over almost everything else. Sweden will not have most of these problems. Yes, they messed it up with the elderly care facilities, and we will get more into that in episode 3, but over the long run, those who supported lockdown type of policies will have to explain why tens of thousands of younger people had to die for no reason other than the fact that they panicked like a bunch of fools that they indeed are. No matter how loud panickers scream, economics is life. Terrible economics means terrible and shorter life, and a lot more death. It just is what it is. Reason number four, keeping the peace. Many commentators have speculated, some of them jokingly, others in all seriousness, that imposing a lockdown would have been impossible because the diverse population would have never observed it. We heard this at least five times during our research, but it's not a good enough claim because in the field it doesn't really check out. In Malmö, for instance, the most diverse city in all of Scandinavia, really, it wasn't the diversity roaming the streets that much. In Rinkeby, sometimes known as Little Mogadishu, for the first time I saw mostly Swedes on the streets. In the crowded buses and trains we used to go around the country, me and my colleague were usually the only foreigners. Well, except public transport in Malmö, of course, where even my rusty Swedish accent counted me more as a native than most of the travelers. What we're saying is that from the field observation, it seems that at least some of the diversity is in fact a lot more keen on observing the FHM recommendations than the natives. Whether that's a good thing or a bad thing is, of course, up for debate. In chats with the people in a Somali-slash-Arab restaurant in Rinkeby, we were told that the whole community coughed badly in late March and early April, but then everyone was fine. Everyone knew at least one person who caught the Wuhan virus, but nobody knew anyone who died from it. So, there's that. The only trouble with the diversity during this period was when lefty politicians seriously argued that the diversity doesn't understand the recommendations because they're only broadcast in and written in Swedish. That's what explains many public displays like this one. Lo and behold, the new Swedes didn't like this and considered it patronizing. And quite frankly, they're not wrong. Unlike 2017, I didn't need English or Arabic to get around these communities. In fact, English was quite useless. Clearly, all those years in which the most studied foreign language in Sweden was Swedish are finally starting to pay off. With all of that said, though, there is an argument to be made that keeping the peace was a factor. One has to understand that outright shutting the border to everyone is unbelievably haram in Sweden. It's just not acceptable, period. Temporary limitations from some areas, yes, but shutting it down completely? Absolutely not. And it wouldn't have been the diversity that protested, but the very native population. Also, borders aside, Swedes are accustomed to see friendly police officers who don't go around bossing people. Now, imagine a lockdown scenario in which the police comes in in such a lovely day down on these people playing volleyball in a gigantic park in Stockholm. By the way, according to the pandemic rules in place at the moment of this filming, which I believe was June the 20th, this volleyball game was illegal in Romania because it gathered more than six people. The fines for it are unconstitutional, but that's another story. The point is that the police itself might have had a problem if the government suddenly required them to stop pursuing real crimes, of which Sweden has no shortage of, and start patrolling the streets to force people indoors or nag them for playing volleyball. 
that would not have been conducive to keeping the peace, for sure. Swedes may be comfortable, indeed way too comfortable with the government telling them what to think, but they're not comfortable at all with anyone, least of all the government, to micromanage their own lives. And that's an aspect that most recent immigrants also share. In other times, I would have argued that's just basic common sense, but the recent experience in current times says otherwise, so we'll keep that point for another day. <laughs> Ultimately, one can come up with many post-factum rationalizations, and we will debunk the most common of them in the next episode, but from a political perspective, these four reasons are clearly the ones that matter and the ones that you can check for yourself by combining the footage presented and the links provided in the low bar. With all of the flaws in the politics of Sweden, and we've covered many of them in the last five years on this channel, and we'll probably cover a lot more in the next five, but for once, the framework aligned with the view of liberty rather than collectivism. Who said a broken clock can't get it right from time to time? <laughs> but no, seriously, <clears throat> the legal framework compelled everyone to stay in the realm of reason and calm rather than the realm of panic and stupidity, like we're witnessing in Romania right now, for instance. Constrained by the heavy limits on power, the government had to, whether it wanted to or not, had to result to persuasion and appeals to reason. There were plenty here in Sweden who, just like in Romania, claimed nobody will care unless it's mandatory, but as Anders Tegnell correctly pointed out, people got used to the disease, learned to better assess their own individual risks, and as such, life could go on. Which makes sense. Someone like me, with a very strong immune system, doesn't need the same amount of risk-mitigating strategies for the Wuhan virus as someone in his late 70s with a kidney disease. Imposing my strategy for me on the 70-year-old, and as on me, would be murder. And imposing on me the strategy for the 70-year-old is tyranny. Neither are acceptable. And that's why observing free will and individual risk assessment is so important. The media also did help, somewhat, unlike literally every other country in Europe. It's not all about this virus. The news about it are proportional to the threat, as opposed to the freak show we could all admire in most of Europe, and can still admire in some parts of Europe right now. Even at the peak of the epidemic, when the number of deaths with the Wuhan virus was pretty high, the reports were still largely reasonable, with a minimum amount of panic art propaganda. At least in terms of public communication, everyone else should take a lesson from Sweden. If you go harsh on people and try to bully them into submission, like it happened in Spain, Italy, Romania, France, Serbia or Hungary, you might run into trouble. In Serbia, the seat of the president got burned. Literally, not figuratively. In Spain, we're witnessing the rise of a legit fascist movement which argues that even their worst excesses are still not as bad as the pandemic policies foisted upon Spain. And that's going to have some effects on the politics of Spain. By the way, Signore Conte in Italy isn't in a much better position either, just like Virgin Orban in Romania isn't either. All things considered, the Swedish experience proves something everyone involved in politics should have known already. If you treat your citizens like children, expect tantrums and unintended consequences. Treat your citizens like what they are, namely adults with varying degrees of reason but all with free will, and you might get a decent result. Oh, but you see, the Italians or the Romanians or the Spaniards would not listen the way the Swedes did. Yeah, no, that's nonsense. But we'll address that mythology and thoroughly debunk it with footage in the next episode. Until then, keep this in mind. Most countries of Europe didn't even try to persuade their citizenry. And keep that in mind next time you vote. With all of that being said, 
Thank you all for watching. Special thanks to all of the donors who made this tour possible to begin with. Don't forget to subscribe, visit our website, and um, yeah, I will see you all soon on the Freedom Alternative.